the way of the C3 was. And the reason is that he's a bright guy. <laughs> pen, right? And a pen focus on the objective that he wants to tackle. And also because of that, he has been awarded an uh, uh, European research grant, young, uh, research young, uh, young uh, European research, research grant, starting grant. Starting grant, young starting grant. And to also to work on these topics uh, that, that he's now going to introduce now. And he has been done very successfully now in, in Bethesda, or because of the talk, he has already started all that. And I, I, again, this is, he, he tried to focus a lot on the objective, it has been very good, it has developed uh, a lot of things, and I have to say that a characteristic of him is that he has a lot of initiative. And this is why, for example, many people try to apply for these starting grants, and very few people get it. Very few people have quite a few ideas, which are new and, and, and suitable to be found. So it is a pleasure to have today Yanni Chambo, please. Uh, thank you very much, Pera. I think you did put a lot of pressure on me now because I think it's from a very bright guy. <laughs> so we'll see what the, what the outcome will be. So thank you very much for, for welcoming me here and for attending the, uh, the talk. So the title is Monolithic Optical Frequency Count Generators, Theory and Applications. Uh, my purpose today is not truly to get into the details of everything, but much more to present uh, a field that is gaining power and thirst, and, um, and that, to my modest point of view, is extremely passionate. So I hope that you will enjoy it. Um, when, we call about, when we talk about optical frequency comes, in fact, we are talking about an idea that is extremely simple from a purely theoretical point of view. Basically, an optical frequency count is a set of extremely narrow and equidistant spectral lines in the ultraviolet, visible, and infrared spectral range. So as you know, when you have a wavelength, you have a color. So basically, an optical frequency count is a set of colors that are in the frequency space, evenly uh, distributed. Uh, there is a very um, intriguing mathematical fact, which is that if you consider in the time domain, so here we're in the time domain, you consider a train of narrow pulses. For theoretical purposes, you can consider that these are Dirac pulses. A regular train where the pulses are separated by a distant delta t. That when you go to the Fourier spectrum, you obtain an optical frequency count. Where here, the spectral separation delta omega is just the frequency that is related to delta t. So delta omega here is 2 pi over delta t. So here what you have is, if in the time domain you have very narrow pulses, regularly spaced, when you take the Fourier spectrum, you obtain an optical frequency count. So it's pretty easy, I think, to understand. Uh, the best thing we can do right now in physics as far as narrow pulses are concerned are basically femtosecond pulses. So if you have mudlock lasers who output uh, evenly spaced uh, narrow um, femtosecond pulses, then you obtain a pretty broad uh, optical frequency come in the Fourier spectrum. Now, the idea is simple from a mathematical point of view, but of course the implementation has, for all the simplest ideas, is quite challenging. And uh, two people obtained the Nobel Prize in 05 for the achievements uh, in the optical frequency com technology, namely uh, John Hall and Theodore Hensch, and for, I quote, their contributions to development of laser-based precision spectroscopy, including the optical frequency comp technique. So these two uh, scientists have obtained the prize in 05 because uh, they have provided key contributions to optical frequency metrology, that is, technology that enables a coherent link between optical and microwave frequencies. Remember that when you have a comp, each line is an optical frequency, typically 200 terahertz, while the distance between lines is a microwave frequency typically tens of megahertz or so. So these two scientists have obtained a prize in 05 for uh, the, their contribution for optical frequency uh, metrology. And they have <coughs> principally investigated optical frequency comps uh, generated by femtosecond uh, lasers. Now, when we're talking about monolithic optical frequency comps, the first question that comes to the mind is, what's the point? If the technology is already so mature that people have been awarded Nobel Prize of Physics for it, what can we do more about it. 
Well, the point is that when you uh, consider mud locked lasers, they look like this. They are tabletop experiments. Of course, I took that same case. You know, this is to introduce a talk, so I have to take it. I Googled and I looked for the broadest, <laughs> largest uh, mud lock laser I could find. You can honestly find mud lock lasers that are smaller, but still, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they will be, you can find mud lock lasers that are the side of this laptop. Uh, but our point mainly is to build uh, optical frequency counts that can be handheld that you can put in your hand. This is what we want to do. And typically today, this is something that is uh, not affordable. So this is our objective. It's very simple. Downsize this. Have a generator of optical frequency counts that is that possibly could be handheld. OK, so this is the outline of the talk. I'll first talk about whispering element resonators. I'll tell you what, uh, what they are and why we're interested in them. I will talk about KCOM generation. Then I will talk about the application of these KCOMs. Uh, after that, we will present the model, how we study these, uh, these phenomena, how we study the generation of these comes, and at the end, there will be a small surprise. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, whispering the remote resonators. First of all, it's a weird name. First time I, I, I got, I had to work on that, I was like, where does that name come from? from it's very, uh, sorry? From El Escorial. El Escorial. <laughs> Okay, so the Spanish have their a Spanish version of it. <laughs> I believe in relativity. It's a, I think it's perfectly legitimate. The British people think, in fact, it comes from here. Yeah. From. Tell me there was another version. And I can assure you, us in Cameroon, we have another version. <laughs> so <laughs> let's stick to the widespread version. There is some kind of majority rule here, even though one day I will give a talk where I will talk about the current version. But uh, the British version is that um, when you go to the St. Paul's Cathedral in London and you stand in the dome, like here, uh, so here you can, you can stand here and you can walk here, so this is more or less this circumference. Then, a um, long time ago, people noticed that if you are in one part of the dome near the wall and you whisper something, someone that is at the other side can hear. So that is something that was a curiosity for a long time. And uh, the first person who tried to provide a physical explanation to this is Lord Rayleigh. So in 1878, he wrote a book, Theory of Sound, where he provided a ray acoustics explanation of that. More or less what he said is, if you stay here and you speak, the sound reflects in the walls so that someone on the other, hand, on the other side sorry, can hear what you say. So that's the theory that uh, Lord Rayleigh proposed in 1878. Good. Uh, 20, 25 years later, he wanted to propose, in fact, a wave theory for the same phenomenon. So he wrote this article, The Problem of the Whispering Gallery, by a lot, really, in the Philosophical Magazine that is in 1910. And then he proposed a wave theory that was more or less saying that uh, the sound is circulating in some kind of torus uh, near the inner circumference of the dome. So that if you stay in the wall, then you will continuously have some power, acoustic power, so that, of course, if you're here and you whisper something with someone that is here, then understand what you say. And uh, Lord Rayleigh really passed in 1919, so in 1919 he died, but two years after his death, Raman and Sutherland, and this Raman is the one who got the Nobel Prize in 1930 for the Raman scattering, so the Indian physicist. And the co-author wrote a paper in that in nature, who was already you know, very concerned about his H index and everything. <laughs> what he had to do. So uh, he published that paper entitled Whispering Gallery Phenomena at Samples Cathedral. And more or less, that was a criticism of Rayleigh's paper. I invite you to Google and read the paper. It is a piece of policy. Of course, first, because people at that time were very courteous. Today, we're not that much. And secondly, because uh, Rayleigh was dead. So you know, you cannot write a comment, a harsh comment about someone's paper when you cannot reply. So what they said, more or less, was the theory is not completely right. It's in reality, and they went to Samples Cathedral and they made an experiment. And they say that what they observed experimentally is that along the circumference, you have nodes and anti nodes. That is, when you are near the wall and you long along the wall, then you find that you have extrema and minima. One thing. Second thing, that when you are near the wall and you're moving away from the wall, that so you're going towards the center, you also have extrema and minima. And this is, they say, we have observed that experimentally. That is not accounted in Rayleigh's theory, but we don't have an explanation either. 
but that's what we see. So we think that really theory is not totally accurate. So the truth is, of course, uh, Raman was right. This is what um, actually you can, you have to observe because this is just a resonator and this is a higher order mode. But even Raman was not totally complete because he only considered uh, discontinuities or this node and anti-node along the circumference when you're coming in, but you forgot this direction. In fact, in the three directions, you have uh, nodes and anti -nodes. Now, um, I've talked about the concept of whispering gallery mode for acoustics. And now the key question is, can we uh, translate these concepts to optics? Can we have whispering gallery modes that are optical modes? And the answer is yes, but in that case, of course, you're not trapping sound, you're trapping light. That is, you're trapping photons. So consider that you have a perfectly spherical optical cavity, something transparent, glass, a crystal, or whatever. And suppose that you have a photon gun, let's say the tip of an optical fiber, okay? And then you shoot somehow a photon inside the cavity. If here you have a refraction, and that would be the case, that is, typically 1.5, 1.3, something like that, and outside you have one, then by total internal refraction, total internal reflection, sorry, the photon will be trapped and will more or less circulate inside the cavity without being able to escape. So theoretically, this is something that is uh, intuitively easy to understand. And you can have here some kind of photonic receiver to extract the photons whenever you want. So from a pure theoretical point of view, the possibility to have optical whispering volume modes is not shocking at all. And actually, uh, you can observe this. This is, for example, a picture where you can see a whispering gallery mode. Whenever I say WGM, is whispering gallery mode. That's the short word. Uh, where you see uh, the tip of a fiber, so it's 70 micron. Typically, the diameter of human hair is 100 micron, 50 to 100 micron. So this is just to give you another magnitude. So here they have a tip of a fiber. They hit it. And when it melts, then after that, by capillary attention, it makes a sphere. And here, they, by fluorescence, you can see here a whispering gallery mode. So this green light that is just traveling uh, in the circumference, in the equator of that spherical resonator. Something that you can see here is since there is nothing going on on the top and on the bottom, then in fact, you don't need all the sphere. You can just have a disk that contains that mode. So basically, you don't even need to have a sphere. You can manufacture a disk and still observe the whispering gallery mode. And this is what we do at uh, the Femtoist Institute. So this is, for example, a disc that was manufactured by René Arrier, a PhD student of Mignon Laurent Largy at Femtoist, uh, Femto sorry. And um, this experiment, in fact, is a setup that has been uh, prepared by Aurélien Collet, a postdoc working with me. And here what they do is they couple green light into a disc resonator. So here you can see the, the fiber here. So it's near enough the resonator so that the light travels here in the inner uh, circumference of the disk. So if you do a zoom in to see it better, then uh, that's what that's how it looks like. So here you have the fiber, and here you have uh, the light that is circulating. So where does the fiber continue? Sorry. Where does the fiber continue? Uh, yes, the fiber is continuing in that case. It's where? a fiber paper. It continues here, but it's too thin to to be seen. But it continues here. It's it's a continuous fiber. So you, why don't you see light in the fiber continuum? Ah, okay, ah, why is there not a continuum? Oh, that's a good question. I'll come to that. Mm -hmm. But that's a very good question. So, um, so here we just took a green laser, so one frequency that is resonant with the resonator, and we shine the resonator with it. Good. And uh, this is a video that shows more or less how that works. So here, what, and this experiment was done by Aurélien Quallet, the postdoc. So what he does, he takes the fiber and makes it to become near the resonator. And when it's near enough, by evanescent coupling, you see that the light goes inside the resonator and then starts to travel. So this is something that we can actually see. I'll play it again for those who missed it. Um, yeah, so uh, here it is. So you make them close, come close together and the light shines into the resonator and then it starts to travel. Good. May, may I ask that? Of course. Shouldn't the in coupling to this disc resonator be as strong as the out coupling back to the It is. It is. It is exactly symmetric. You're perfectly right. So the light that you have in is the light that you have out. And uh, thank you for the question because it allows me to say something that is very interesting. In this picture, we can see the light, in fact, because the resonator is not perfect. If it was perfect, then every photon inside would not get out 
but also you could not put any photon from the outside to the inside. So somehow you need the resonator to be lossy so that you can couple photons inside and that the photon can get outside so that you can see them. So that is something that is very important. And that's only loss for escaping, not scattering inside the uh, In fact, all type of losses, but you have in fact coupling losses. Uh, so the losses that are induced by the fact that with the fiber you come near the resonator and you have some light coming in, but after that you have scattering losses. And you're right because in fact you can see the light everywhere because it scatters everywhere. So, and these scattering losses are not due to the coupling. The scattering loss helps with coupling? No. no, it does not. It's a different kind of loss. So, at the introduction of this talk, I talked about the uh, Rayleigh theory where I used first uh, ray acoustics and after that you moved to wave acoustics. So, here in optics, it's the same thing. We have this ray optics interpretation that is very intuitive and that is very useful, in fact. And you also have, after that, an electromagnetic wave interpretation. What you say is, okay, we have a cavity, we have light inside that cavity, so we solve the Maxwell equations with the suitable boundary conditions, and then we can find the model profiles, and we can, of course, find the eigenfrequencies. And, surprise, when we make the calculation, we find that the eigenfrequencies of a WGM resonator are quasi equidistant. Good. Now, what are these modes, in fact? Remember, here, a mode, in fact, requires that a photon couples a round trip. To have resonance, you need to have an integer number of reflections here. Here, for example, you have eight. So this mode, for example, can be this one, this red mode. It will be the mode eight. A mode that will do nine reflections to close a round trip will be the following. So this will be a mode, the mode with nine reflections, 10, 11, 12, etc. So in fact, in the simplest case, you only need one eigen number that we call L to label a mode. And that number just says the number of reflection that the photon does to perform a round trip. And of course, this number has to be an integer. So uh, now I want to talk a little bit about the Q factor because this is something that we already had two questions about the Q factor. So it's definitely something that is central to whispering gallery mode resonators. So how long can you trap a photon in a cavity? That's one thing to put a photon inside, but how long can you have it? That is something that is very critical. Uh, when you have a bandpass filter of any kind, RLC thing or whatever, you have a central frequency here, omega zero, and you have a band with delta omega zero. And you define the Q factor of your filter has the ratio between the central frequency and the bandwidth. In optics, you do the same. If here you have an optical mode whose central frequency is omega zero and line width is delta omega zero, you can define the Q factor of the optical mode has the ratio between the central optical frequency and the line width. And in fact, this Q factor is also proportional to what we call here the photon lifetime. So these are, have three consequences. The first consequence is that high Q factor means that you have narrow line width. Of course, when this goes to zero, then Q is very high. The second consequence is that high Q factors induce long photon lifetimes. If you have a perfect cavity, then the photon lifetime is infinite because it stays there forever. And then the Q factor is infinite. So the Q factor and the photon lifetime are proportional. And high Q factor in, or mean or indicate low losses. Of course, when you don't have a lot of losses, it means that you have photons that can stay for a long time. So just to give you orders of magnitude, in the green laser experiment that I just showed you, the Q factor was around 10 to the power 10 to 8. Uh, the record that I know is 10 to 11. Here, with this green light, it was kind of 10 to 8. Um, this green photon did undergo around 40 thousand reflections to perform a round trip. So I showed you a ray optics interpretation with eight reflections, but in reality, the wavelength of the photon is so small that, for example, just the experiment I showed you, a green photon makes 40,000 reflections to perform a round trip. They did perform typically 10,000 round trips before annihilation. So they did spin inside the resonator around 10,000 times before they were absorbed or radiated or something. And overall, they stayed into the cavity for approximately 0 0.1 microsecond. And the record that I know is set as 100 microsecond. That is, if you take this, um, the record Q factor that is 10 to 11, then uh, the record is something like 100 microsecond, which is huge if you can trap a photon for something that is anywhere close in millisecond. This is something that is truly, truly, truly huge. And in fact, you do that for infrared photons because for those of you who are familiar with um, uh, telecom um, applications when you take silica or crystals, in fact, they have a minimum of absorption in the, in the infrared um, wavelength uh, range. 
when you say the record and all that is in this kind of resonators or in any resonators? In this kind of resonators. So the rocket, in fact, you obtain them for this kind of resonators. If you take other kinds, in fact, you have Q factors that are lower. Typically, for example, the sphere that I showed you, typically will have a Q factor of 10 to 4, 10 to 5, something like that. So when you want to go to 10 to 11, you need to have millimeter size resonators that are, if I can say so, hand polished. So uh, while telling about the Q factor, why did I take uh, two, three minutes to talk about it? Well, it's a very indirect way to win the Nobel Prize. If you remember this year, uh, this man, uh, Serge Laroche, uh, was awarded Nobel Prize of Physics for uh, his experiment on the non-destructive measurement of photons. And very few people know that 15, 17 years ago, Laroche, in fact, was working on Nobel Eugene resonators. Here, for example, this is a paper he published in Optics Letters where he was working on what we call the splitting of modes. The thing is, when you have the photons that are circulating, sometimes they find an impurity and they are reflected back. So you have clockwise and counterclockwise. You have kind of two modes that have a splitting, and he was studying that in, in WGM resonators. And in this other paper, he was uh, studying how these whispering or remote resonators, this is a, pair, a paper of 96, how these lasers can be used as lasers. How these resonators, sorry, can be used as lasers because you have a cavity. If you dope the cavity, then it resonates, and then you can have a laser. So he has been working on that. And uh, one of his major achievements that more or less led uh, him to obtain the Nobel Prize is he built this photon box. Because of course, if you want to perform the non-destructive measurement of photons, you need to have them in a box for a long time. It means that you need a very high Q uh, cavity in order to have the photons in there for a long time and be able to perform your experiments. OK, so there are various type of WGM resonators. Uh, and to move forward with the question you asked me, this is the kind we work with. Typically, we take a disc, we polish it, and we need, in fact, to have in the rim, typically, this is the size of um, a coin of one euro, of one uh, cent of euro, or two cents of euro, something like that. And we polish the rim, because, of course, this is where the photons are um, performing their, their reflection. But you have other kinds, too. Even though we work mostly with this kind, you can have uh, integrated rings. So here, for example, we have the waveguide that couples the lights in, and this is a, an integrated ring. Here the size is typically 10 microns. So you, ca you can have that kind of resonators. You can have this kind of resonators in few silica that we call mushroom resonators, because they look like mushrooms. So you have a pedestal, and here you have the resonator that is up there. And you have what we call also bottle resonators. So here, for example, you have trio resonators in the same rod. So here there's one, there's another, and there's another. So in fact, WGM, Resonators can be manufactured in a, a lot of very, very different ways. So now when we talk about care optical frequency counts. We have these resonators. We know how to trap the photons and so forth and so on. Uh, the way we want to build comes heavily relies on the care effect. And I know a lot of people here are familiar with, with that effect, but I would just want to say a word about it. Um, typically, we have a refraction index. Here, that will depend on the E radius, which is just to make it short, the intensity power. So you have the refraction index that is, in fact, field dependent. If the field increases, then you have higher refraction index. And if the field goes down, then you have less. So consider that you have a linear cavity. If you have a linear cavity, what's going on is that the photons do not interact. Uh, each mode is independent from the other. And then you have no mode coupling. And then, to come to your question, it means that if we shine the green, a green laser in the cavity, the cavity stays green, because the green laser have their life, their boson life, and they don't interact with anything else, and they stay green. But if we have a nonlinear cavity, then the photons do interact. And then all the, mod, all the modes so we interact with each other. How exactly, we don't know. We'll talk about that in the model. But the basic way what's going on is you have modes, in fact, that will have effects on others. So far, we just consider that it's some kind of random effect. But modes are not independent anymore. So that is the big difference between a linear cavity and a nonlinear one. Now, the quantum representation of that carry effect is that we consider that we have some kind of fourth wave mixing, meaning that we have two photons, here the photons alpha and mu, that are annihilated <coughs> and create two other photons. So here you have the photons alpha and mu that interact through the K medium and generate two other photons, eta and beta following these very simple photonic reactions. Two photons in, two photons out. You have basically two rules to respect here. The first one is conservation of energy. Of 
or you simplify each bar, it means that you have the sum of the frequent of the input frequencies has to be equal to the sum of the output frequencies. And you need to conserve the angular momentum here, that is this famous eigen number L's that have also to more or less obey the same laws as the frequencies. So how does that uh, help for com generation? Well, if you pump the system on the threshold, you can consider it's a bold approximation. For the purpose of the talk, we can consider that the cavity is linear. And then uh, our green laser does not interact, our green modes, our green photons do not interact with the others. Here, so here you have some kind of noise. They don't interact. So you shine it, the cavity is green, it stays green. If you pump the cavity above a given threshold, then that is what occurs. You might have, for example, two photons from this green laser. One is down converted and one is up converted. And so on, and so on. And it just obeys this very simple photonic reaction. Two photons from the pump, one goes up, one goes down. Now, if you need a take on message, here it is. This is how we want to build the com. We want to shine only a single laser frequency, strong enough, and rely on the nonlinear effects to populate and to excite other modes. And since we already know that WGM resonators have quasi equidistant modes, then that's how, that's how more or less we want to have a com. Take a small resonator, shine the light strong enough so that we hit the nonlinearity. And then through the nonlinearity, we excite all the modes. And then we have a comp. That's more or less the game plan. So that's the idea. And uh, here we'll just take a few, uh, few minutes to say about the pioneering works, experimental works, the first comps that ever were observed. Uh, the first one was a three mode scale comp. So basically, you don't pay too much attention to the experimental setup. You just need to know that there's a laser that is pumping a cavity. So here's the cavity. There's a laser. And they obtain something like this. They had a pump. One photon went down, we call that the signal. One photon went up, we call that the idler. And uh, here the distance is a microwave frequency. It's a comb already, only three modes, but it's already a comb. Uh, when, then we have another work that was also published in 04, where they had five modes. And now they use that kind of resonators. So here, um, you have that pedestal that I talked about. Here, the size of the resonator is 50 microns. You have the resonator here. And they obtained this. They had five modes. So here you have the pump, idler, signal, and you did were successful in generating two uh, more uh, modes. And in 07, there was a breakthrough. A paper that we published here by um, in the Kippenberg group, I think, in a PFL, where they were successful using this microtorid resonator to generate a comb like this. So this already starts to look like something uh, that truly looks like the combs that we want uh, at the end. Here you have a pump at 15, 50 nanometers, and here you see that we have something like 50 moles that are excited. And this was truly a breakthrough paper because for the first time, they could use a small resonator like this, and once again, I say this is 20 microns, so this is of the size of human hair, and they can generate a comb like this. Good. Uh, care combs today are wider, they are stronger, they are more stable. Here I just show you an overview of some snapshots of comms that I took from the literature. You find everything. Today it's, I will not say easy, but it's widespread to make K comms. And once again, it's always the same thing. You have a pump laser. You, if you pump strong enough, then you have uh, the nonlinearity that enables to have a wide, uh, wide span comm. This one I'm not like very much because that's the comm that we obtained in our lab. It's pretty clean and I think it looks good. Those are continuous wavelength. Uh, continuous wavelength, exactly. It's continuous comb. Sorry, I didn't say that. It's continuous wavelength. You are missing uh, hairs in your comb. How come? Sorry? In your comb, some hairs are missing. How come? Ah, yeah. Yeah. That is something that, uh, that is a very, uh, I, and the way I, when I talk with uh, Aurelien, I told him that in life, like in optics, when the teeth is missing, it's not very steady. So, um, we don't know why that comb is missing. Uh, we suspect that is a trigger problem in, uh, the spectrometer, we're not sure, but uh, effectively there, there's one teeth that is missing and, and we are still trying to find out. Sorry? Uh, no, no, no. So that's why we think it was like a trigger problem in, in the oscilloscope. But we still kind of monitor that. But you're right. There is a teeth missing here. A tooth missing, sorry. So what are the applications of KCOMs? One thing is to generate these comes, and another thing is to try to know what they're useful for. Uh, the first application is ultra-stable microwaves. What are we talking about when we talk about ultra-stable microwaves? So consider that you have a noiseless oscillator, okay? So microwave or a 
a sinusoidal signal. When you go to the state space, you have something like this. So because it's sinusoidal, of course, you have this representative point that spins like this. So at time zero, this is what you have. If you wait one period, then this point makes a round trip and comes exactly where it was. If you go five periods, this is the very same thing. And if you go 20 periods, the same. In fact, as long as you look at the system periodically, the figurative uh, point of the system will not move. It will stay exactly where it was. It means that here you have a perfect clock whose phase is rigorously constant. Now, of course, this exists in textbook, but not in real life. In real life, what you have is a noisy oscillator. So you start like here. After one period, you see that the figurative point has done a round trip and was kind of a little bit faster. So it does not overlap this one. After five periods, you see that it never overlaps. And after 20 periods, you have already lost track of what that clock does. Of course, this is a very lousy clock. It will not serve for any purpose. But this shows you the idea of how phase noise is important and what is the accuracy of the clock. So uh, here, this is a clock that loses accuracy with time. And in fact, it performs a one-dimensional burning motion along the circle. So, uh, what are these uh, useful? Uh, what are these uh, ultra-stable clocks uh, useful for? The first um, application of clocks, generally, I mean, high-tech application, is aerospace engineering. So, here, just to give you orders of magnitudes, all the watches that you have in this room might win or lose one second per day. That is the accuracy of a wristwatch quartz clock, typical. Uh, when you consider the clock that is in the GPS satellite, it's something like 10 to the minus 8 seconds per day. There's already 8 others of magnitude better. And if you take the cryogenic clocks, then it's 10 to the minus 10. So there, is, there are 10 others of magnitude difference between the best clocks you have and the typical clock that you have on your wrist or in your computer or in your mobile phone. The second... Um, Interest the second use of these ultra stable microwaves are radars. And here you need also very stable um, microwaves because when you have a radar, in fact, you send a probe wave and you have a feedback and then you compare what you send with what you have. So you need what you send has to be very stable so that whatever comes, you can make a very accurate comparison. And uh, also, here just to give you orders of magnitudes, a micro synthesizer that are used like in satellites or something like that, don't care about the unit. The important thing here is that these are decibels. So a micro synthesizer that you might find in a satellite or something is something like minus 80 dBc per hertz. If you look for a radar probe, pretty accurate, then it's minus 140. And the best micro sources go down to minus 170 dBc per hertz. It means that between already a very good micro synthesizer that you can find in a satellite and the best micro sources, you already have 90 dB. So here the important message to take is that the gap the orders the order of magnitudes of difference between daily applications and high-tech applications are huge. Here you have 10 orders of magnitudes, here you have 9 degrees. Uh, and why are these uh, CARICOMs useful in the case of ultra-stable microwaves? Well, the thing is, uh, we should not forget that CARICOMs are coherent. That is, when you take one photon here and one photon here, these two photons are correlated. So they keep a, very, a fixed phase difference between them. And uh, here, for example, you see the phase noise of, of the microwave extracted here, and it's very stable. And amongst other advantages, you can consider compactness. As I, you saw, these resonators are very small. So in fact, you can have then a microwave generator that is extremely compact. Uh, small power consumption. Generally, uh, the, you can excite the comp for something like 1 milliwatt, 10 milliwatt. So the, the power consumption is very small. Immunity to interferences, this is very important for aerospace applications because when you send a satellite or a spacecraft, generally the interferences can jam the whole system. So if you generate your microwaves with an optical system, you are interference immune. Uh, frequency versatility, by changing the size of the resonator, in fact, you change the frequency output, so you can basically have any frequency output you have, you want, sorry. Uh, compatibility with both microwave and lightwave communication systems. You also, in fact, need these ultra-stable microwaves uh, in optical communication. So if you generate them already with telecom lasers, then everything becomes uh, compatible. And ultra stable signal distribution without penalty over five nanograms. And this is due to the fact, again, that you are generating the, these microarrays with uh, telecom lasers. So another application that is very interesting is WGM networks. So here we can consider these comps as multi wavelength coherent sources. So what you have here is we have a pump. So we pump this resonator at 1550, so typical telecom wavelength. And at the output, we have a coherent telecom. 
So this is what we have at the input. The light comes in, all the nonlinear stuff occurs here. And at the output, this is what you have. And you can use that for WDM uh, telecommunications. Here, it's cost effective. This, once it's optimized, it costs something like, I don't know what, one euro, something like that. I mean, of course, at the front end. Uh, you can have up to 500 stable spectral lines. And uh, the coherence between the modes enables advanced modulation formats. It means that you can use these, all these spectral lines are correlated between themselves. So in fact, you can use not these lines not only for amplitude modulation, but also for phase uh, modulation. Um, it's also believed that um, these scale counts might be useful for photonic chips. So basically you have a chip like this. Once again, remember the size is 20 microns. When we talk about full optical processing, the big idea is that when we have today electronic processors, we have in fact components that can perform both linear and long nonlinear operations. And if we want to have one day processors that are full optical, then we'll need to have optical components that can perform linear and nonlinear operations. So this is what we need. Nonlinear operations, we already know that these systems can perform CARECOM generation, Brillouin lasing, Raman scattering, two photon assortion. So we already know that a lot of nonlinear phenomena can occur here. Also, even though we are always interested into the nonlinear, in the linear part, this system can also perform amplification, filtering, modulation, phase shifting, etc. So, these very small optical components can already perform nonlinear or linear operations, and now it's just a form of putting all these things together and make it work, which is easier to say than to do. And this, for example, an artistic view of what a photonic chip will be here. You see, for example, a WGM resonator. This is the, 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 the bus web guy that will provide the light, and here you see, for example, the mode side. This is a picture I took from the web. I think it's, it's really beautiful. Okay, so uh, at Femto, besides working on, um, on crystalline resonators, like the one I showed you with the green light, uh, we also work within this project, the uh, Labex Action. They, the government decided to give money to the institute so that they can, do, uh, they can build what they call Excellence Lab, and we got part of that money. And uh, what we'd want to do is, in fact, integrate WGM resonators for photonics applications. And this is, for example, a resonator that was manufactured at Femto by uh, this research engineer, Ron Salu. We're working together on this project. And uh, here you see the waveguide. And this is the resonator. And uh, here you see a zoom in of what is going on here. So this is the waveguide. So what is the scale? Is this OK, so this is 600 micron, so half a millimeter, the diameter. And uh, here the gap is something like 20 nanometers, something like that. So we can control everything. We can control this width. We can control the gap. We can control just everything, the aid of the, of the resonator, everything. And uh, what we want to do then is to build these chips that I was talking about. And this work is, this work is, is, is still in progress. So when we talk about WGM resonators, uh, applications go beyond K-Pumps. Here I just took some Russian nature covers on WGM resonators. There are many. It's, it's truly a, a topic that is currently extremely active, extremely uh, full of life, and there are a lot of, com of contributions that are very, very uh, passionate here. For example, they are talking about uh, diamond resonators. Here they are talking about resonators that have, that have mag uh, magnetic properties. I think these are IBM people. Uh, this is liquid state double digit resonators. So it goes in all directions. There are a lot of people working on this. And here I'm just talking about the covers in the last five years. but. I'm not talking about the articles, there are, I don't know, five, eight times more. So, so far I presented you, the, talked about the WGMs from Lord Rayleigh and the controversy with Raman. I talked about KCOMs, what we do with these KCOMs, and now it's time to talk about the math. As you have seen, most of the results are experimental. There is very, very, a very small amount of work, theoretically, that has been done to understand how it actually CARECOM generation occurs. So um, the first thing we have to do is we have to find, to determine exactly what is the shape of the, these eigen modes. So consider here that you have a resonator, we call, consider it's a truncated sphere. Then when you zoom in here, you see that this is the section of the mode. So normally we have what we call a donut mode. So it's a torus-like mode. And uh, here you have the radial profile, here the polar profile is like a tire. So model profile, this is how it looks like. Here we have the normalization factor. I hide it because it's not that important. It's just so that the integral goes to one. Uh, you have the radial profile. Here it is. You have here the polar profile. Here it goes. And this is just a phase 
uh, term that tells you that, in fact, you need an integer L number of reflections. When you find the model profile, so you obtain this by solving the Maxwell equations for the cavity. After that, you need to find the eigenfrequencies. So the eigenfrequencies only depend, as I explained earlier, on a, this integer eigennumber, L. So this gives you the equidistant term. This is a constant term. And here you see that when L changes by units, then you have this gap that we call the free spectral range, FSR, which is the, the spectral distance between two modes. So when you consider this equation, this is what it gives you, a, an equidistant term. Now, uh, life is not easy. Uh, so you have to take into account other terms that are kind of nasty, like material dispersion, because here you have a comp. All these lines do not see the same refraction index. Each of one sees a different refraction index. So for each spectral line, it's a different cavity. So that induces this term. And the other nasty term is this geometrical dispersion that is, in fact, takes into account the curvature of the, of the disk. So at the end of the day, you don't have an exactly equidistant comp, but you have something like this that is slightly not equidistant. But this equidistance, which in fact is dispersion, is extremely important. And later on, I will tell you why it is so important. In fact, with that, yeah. Can you manage the material dispersion to compensate for the, for the geometrical one? We can use uh... Theoretically, yes. <coughs> in practical, it's just a bulk crystal. Yeah, but, but, so, uh, but, but theoretically, in fact, theoretically. You can manage the dispersion of the crystal by putting impurities or whatever. That's true, but the problem is then the Q factor goes down. Oh, okay. So that's, that's the, the trade-off. But theoretically, people have been working and found what is the exact dispersion uh, relation that you need to have to compensate everything. But in fact, at the beginning, people thought that they didn't want dispersion because it did lead to non-equidistance. But at the end, as I will show, dispersion is extremely important to obtain the actual count. So model expansion, uh, I will just go through the main steps of the model. So you consider that you have an electric field, then you expand. So you consider here that the total field is a model expansion. So here you have the field amplitude, here you have the field frequency, here you have the model profile. And here you consider that you have an external quantum field. Uh, you take this expansion, you plug it into the normal Helmholtz equation, so the Maxwell equation, you plug it here. And here you consider that this relative permittivity is equal to n squared inside the resonator and to one outside. And of course, n squared here, or n, will depend on the frequency. So you have a dispersion here, you take into account dispersion. You take into account the losses by considering that the refraction index is complex, you take into account the losses. And here the kernel linearity, here you have the care uh, coefficient. So you consider, so overall, that you have a refraction index that is dispersive, lossy, and that is non linear. So you take that, you plug it, you do all the math, and finally you end up with this equation. So here we have normalized the field so that A squared is the number of photons per mode. The mode eta, so A eta squared is the number of photons. So the terms here are the model bandwidth. As I say, this is related to the two factor. These are the losses, simply. Uh, you have the external pumping field. Uh, you have the laser detuning, because remember, these are modes, so they have a width. And we need to have a laser that is inside the cavity, so it can have a detuning relatively to the central frequency of the mode. Uh, here you have the forward mixing, so it's just a non-linearity of the medium. Here what we call the intermodal coupling tensor, all the modes do not have the same shape. So they have some kind of spatial overlap that defines the strength of how two modes interact. So here it is. And you have what I call the intermodal detuning, which is just a term that occurs, but in fact this is dispersion. This is in fact a dispersive term. So basically the model approach is if we want to simulate 200 modes, then we consider that we have to find an equation for each mode. So here, this is the equation for the mode eta. If we have 200 modes, when I write the code, I have two equations like this. And this is the coupling between all of them. Here, this sum. It's just the coupling between all the modes. If I have 200 modes, I have 200 equations. It's as simple as that. When you had, at the beginning you said that you had about 40,000 reflections. Yeah. But these are not 40,000 modes. You don't, but you don't need all the 40,000 modes. You no, need... if, if I have 40,000 reflection, it means that it is the mode number 40,000. Yeah, that, but I mean, then that, that, but the number of modes that you need on that is so far. It can be, it can be uh, 100, 200, depending. If you remember, for example, the spectra that I, that I showed you, typically the spectra had 100, 200 modes. And the higher the modes, with respect to these 40,000, has higher losses, I guess. Yes, but right now we don't, yeah, because here in fact, but here, this is not accounted it is not, I mean, here it is, because here I say that the losses are eta dependent, but for the analysis, we consider that the losses are the same. 
So, uh, so this is then the model model. And the, the first thing that we have to study is what is the threshold power to obtain the comp? We know that if we pump stronger enough, we'll have a comp. But how is strong enough? So that was the first thing that we wanted to take up in the model. Analyze how we can find the threshold for the generation of the comp. So now we consider that we have here a mode. For the sake of simplicity, I still consider that we have our green buttons. I put it here. Here I have only noise in all these other modes. I only have noise. Uh, when I pump it strong enough, I consider that I will start to have two photons. One goes down, one goes up. If the, nothing says that it has to come to the must, to the, to the adjacent mode. It can go anywhere, up here. And when I do the perturbation equation, don't get into the detail, I find that the threshold power is this one. That is the threshold number of photons I have to put, to put here in order to trigger the comp generation. And just to give you a glimpse of how important this is, it says that it is inversely proportional to the nonlinearity. So if I have high nonlinearity, then I have low threshold. It is inversely proportional to the Q factor. So if I have high Q factor, I have a low threshold. These are two things that are very important to keep in mind. And I also find what is the threshold mode. That is the first mode that emerges here. It depends on this parameter, the which is dispersion, and on the laser detune. Um, yes. V0 is the mode volume, or what is V0? Yeah, it's the, it's the mode volume. I didn't stress that because I didn't talk in detail about it, but it is effectively the mode volume. So, and this is the stability map then. Uh, this is what occurs. Here we have the modes. Okay, so the mode zero, here L is L minus L zero. So what we call zero here is the mode that we pump. And these are the modes that are nearby. One, two, three, etc. from minus 100 to 200. And this is the pump power. So what occurs is then we pump here. And if we pump a threshold, so here it's normalized. So here we're at one. And uh, when we pump a threshold, what, what occurs is that we have this mode here. It's minus 50 and plus 50, that will be the first mode to emerge. If I increase that pump, if I pump twice harder, then I obtain what I call the primary comp. I have the photons that, that will come here and that will come here, because this band, in fact, is the intersection between this line and this uh, stability map, and this stability area. And after the primary comp, then I will have photons from the pump and the primary comp that will, co that will uh, cooperate to generate what I call a secondary comp. So what the model tells us is that Comp generation is not as a priori we thought, that you just have to pump enough and all the photons will go from the pump to all the modes. It is a cascading mechanism. It goes from the pump to what we call the primary comp. After that, you have secondary comp, after that, a third order, etc. So it's a cascading process. And uh, when we did random numerical simulations, this is exactly what we saw. So here we have the modes, and here we have the time at one microsecond. At eight microseconds, we see that the photons, so at the beginning, at one microsecond, all the photons are in there. Eight microseconds, the photon go to what we call the primary comp, so this band and that band, which are the stability bands. And after, they fill all the gap. And this is, for example, a comp that you can play. But here we see in numerical simulations that the comp generation is a sequential process. And uh, experimentally, this is what we will see. So the experimental system is pretty simple. You have a continuous wave laser. Here, a polarization control. You consider that you, you have a cavity. Here is calcium fluoride. Uh, this is just the tip of the, what I call the photon gun. So it's a, a fiber that is, that is shaped in a particular angle. Here you can monitor the resonances. Since it's in uh, reflection, then you have anti-resonances, but these are the modes, in fact. And here you can just recuperate and you see the comp. So here you pump hard enough, to make it simple, you pump hard enough, you see the comp here in the optical spectrum analyzer. So some experimental uh, data, the cavity area just here was 2.3 millimeters. So the distance between two modes was 14 gigahertz, 0.5. The laser end width was 5 kilohertz, so extremely narrow uh, laser. Uh, the cavity was pumped near 1560, the telecom wavelength. So the eigen number here was 14,350. And the Q factor was nearly 10 to 9, meaning that we had a photon lifetime that was nearly 1 microsecond. And this is what we got. So these experiments have been made by Strefal of JPL. And we had here a very good agreement, and if I can say so, an excellent agreement between experimental and numerical results. Here, there's something I would like to emphasize. Um, first of all, we have around 200 modes here. It's a lot. It means that we have a system that has typically a dimensional linear of 400. Here, if you pay attention to the dynamical range, is something that is around 70 decibels. Like to have an agreement over 70 decibel of dynamic range is something that is not very common. So it means, in fact, that the model is extremely accurate and can capture the actual dynamics of the system over a wide range of wavelength and dynamical range. What did you 
determines the, the envelope? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, thank you for the question. The thing is, the envelope is determined by the primary and the secondary comb. So this is the pump. This, in fact, is the primary comb. This is the secondary comb. So this also, this also was a confirmation of what you said about the cascading mechanism of conjugation. <coughs> that the photons, when they, once they leave the pump, they don't go anywhere. They first go to what we call the primary comb. And after that, they can go to the secondary comb. And so after the, the very near lines would be the primary comb. Sorry? That's not. So the very close lines would be the primary comb. No, 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 no. That's what the, um, that's what the stability analysis showed is that here the, 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 the first photons that will get, the first uh, modes that will get photons are here and here. They are not necessarily adjacent. Of course, if you change the parameter and these two uh, areas touch each other, then it might be the case. But here it's not necessarily the case. And when we did the simulations, that's what we see, that at one microsecond we have photons here. At eight, the first photon to receive, the first mode, sorry, to receive photons are here, and only after uh, the gaps are filled. Okay, uh, this is uh, a spectrotemporal representation. So basically what we did here was, uh, here we have the frequency and here we have the time. So we see in fact how the spectrum is evolving. So this is the spectrum because these are the frequencies and the time. And we see more or less what's the time dynamics of the spectrum. And it looks chaotic. And when we, perf when we calculated the Lyapunov exponents in the positive. So in fact, we showed that in these cavities, if you come too hard, you have chaos. Which from a dynamical point of view is interesting, but from the point of application, it's not. Because remember, we want things that are very stable, for ultra-stable microwaves, for metrology, and so on and so forth. OK, so now we come to the surprise. Um, we wanted, in fact, to develop some kind of special temporal approach. I talked about the model model. The model model, so the model that relies on the model extension, Provided excellent results. For example, we could determine the thresholds, we could explain the cascade mechanism, and etc. So we were very happy with that model. But it also had some drawbacks, mainly in terms of simulation time. For example, the comb that I showed you, it took me three days to simulate it in a supercomputer. Because, of course, you have 400 nodes that are coupled, and this, the, the coupling term just takes into account all the nodes, so it takes a lot of time to simulate. So that was the main drawback of that, of that model. So, we looked again at the picture and we thought, okay, at the end of the day, <coughs> light propagates here just like in a nonlinear and dispersive optical fiber. We just have light that travels into a fiber. However, the fiber is periodic. After one run trip, it closes to itself. But basically, light propagation in optical fiber, people know how to deal with it. Periodic boundary conditions has been some hundreds of years that physicists know how to deal with that. So we thought that we could find some kind of Knowing in our Schrodinger equation to model care continuation. And this, we thought the ingredients were there. Dispersion, nonlinearity, and so forth. So, uh, these are the steps, only two. Here we define the total field that we call psi. It's just the sum of all the modes with their frequencies and their eigennumbers. Theta here is, of course, the angle since they are in the C conference. And this is the dynamical equation that we found for C. It's an equation that has damping, that has detuning, because remember, we are pumping the cavity, so the laser may not be exactly on the resonance. It has k nonlinearity, it has dispersion, and it has a pump term. And of course, I see these people already look at each other. This is the general favorite equation, <laughs> and which has extensively been studied here by Damia, Manuel, and, and Pera. I would like to stress that to obtain this equation, We've not, we've made no approximation. There is no approximation. You take the field, you sum it up, you do the math to find what is the equation that is fulfilled by C, it's this. There is no approximation. This means that in fact the Lugero Lefebvre equation, at least when we consider only second order dispersion, is the exact counterpart of the model model. The exact counterpart. Now, of course, when we talk about the Lugero Lefebvre equation, there are people who know exactly what it is, but not everybody, so I'll just like to take one minute to say about it. In fact, it's a paradigm for localized structures in dispersive optical cavities. So this paper was published in 87 by Lujara and Lefebvre, and, um, and more or less they introduced this equation that had all the terms that I was talking about. So this is the damping, this is the external driving, this is the nonlinearity, the tuning, and then we have this term that is, in his case, diffraction. And when you consider, for example, the two-dimensional version of this, 
you obtain, for example, cavity solutions like that. This is the picture that I took from the thesis of Daniel. But in our case, this is the equation that we have. We have the same terms, damping, detuning, no linearity. But this term, be careful, is dispersion. Not only that, but second thing very important is that here we have an angular variable, which is periodic. Now, the thing that is funny is that generally the boundary conditions in the Lucero Lefebvre are not naturally periodic. But you find a lot of papers, some cases yes, but most of the time they're not. At least in the original paper they were not. But we still find papers that work on periodic boundary conditions for a lot of things, I think. Scientific curiosity, which is always a good thing, but also practicality. But here, we actually have a system that has periodic boundary conditions for it. Now, of course, I showed a cavity solution in the case of the spatial vegetal Lefebvre equation. I stresses the fact that we had an angular variable in the second order derivative. It means that here we have, we can have angular cavity solutions, and this is exactly what we see. So here you have the angle. So this is just one round trip in the cavity. And you see that when you kick, you observe here the formation of a solution that is robust and that stays there. And now, because I think my, I've been now used to talk with people that have interest for the mathematics and the physics of the things, and also to people that have interest in the technological part. So honestly, I know a lot of people that are truly not very interested in knowing if there is solid on here or not. What they want are terms that are solid so that they can do clocks and things like that. But in fact, when they see the spectrum, then they say, ah, because this spectrum is very nice. It's very stable. It is symmetric. Here you see that we have in a dynamical range of only 40 dBs. We have nearly 400 modes. And every single mode here is filled. This is not chaotic. It is stable. You can make a clock out of this. And the fact that every single mode here is filled is due to the fact that per round trip you only have one pulse. And remember, this is periodic. So you have to take this one and take it again and put it and put it. So you have, in fact, a train of pulses. And if you remember the picture I showed you at the beginning, this explains why here all the modes are filled. Uh, you can also observe other things, like, for example, stripe patterns. This, for example, is stripe pattern. Here you give a kick, and this is what you see in the time domain. But when you go to the frequency domain, you see a comb like this, which is exactly the kind of combs that I studied with the model model without knowing that it was a stripe turing pattern. Is this time, or, or is it moving? I mean, is that door static patterns, or are they... Ah, no, they are moving. They are moving. I, I removed the, um, the good velocity. Yeah, sorry, I didn't say that, but I removed the good velocity. So in fact, they are turning inside the cabin. So these, in fact, are the combs that I studied in the model model. And here, of course, you simulate the general favor equation, and you find them very easily for the same parameters. And of course, this is the first thing I did. I took the first parameters that I had with the model model. I plugged it in to see if I had the same things, and obviously, it was the same thing. Now, uh, finding the Luciano Lefebvre equation in this context is a theoretical breakthrough for outcomes, for a lot of reasons. The first one, the Luciano Lefebvre equation belongs to the nonlinear Schrodinger equation family. There are a lot of works that have been done in that space. It means that we just have to open the door and just pick ideas. For example, this model can easily integrate new features like nonlinearities. Here you have, we have higher order nonlinearities that are due to a lot of things. Curvature, non-uniform non overlap, non-uniform damping. We can integrate all these terms very easily in a partial temporal equation, much more easily than a model expansion model where, we, where you have as much as the equations as models. Here you can easily add higher order dispersion, which in fact here I only consider the certain order dispersion, but when your comb becomes very wide, you cannot consider that you only have the second term of the tail expansion. You have to consider higher order dispersions, which in the Louis-Jadel Lefebvre equation are easy terms to add. They're just higher order derivatives. And you can add new phenomena like Brillouin, Raman, and Rayleigh scattering, also very easy. If you want to do that in a model model, it is very complicated. People already know how to consider, how to integrate these effects in fiber optics. So it will be pretty easy to do it in this context. And in fact, there are, pap there are papers where you have Raman lasers, brilliant lasers, with double resonators. The second thing is 
The regenerative Lefebvre equation en enables easily to spot phenomena that are not easy to spot with the model approach. For example, the soliton is not something that you can easily spot with the model model because you have so much degrees of freedom. The soliton is requires a coherent mod locking between the modes. While when you have a model, model you put modes as initial conditions, then it evolves towards something, but it will not evolve towards the soliton. And for example, Damiano knows very well that the soliton emerge in a very narrow uh, stability band and require particular uh, initial conditions. There is no way you can hit that if you put just noise at the beginning. You need to know exactly where to be to observe the solitons. So from that perspective, the Logero Lefebvre equation provides a significant advantage relatively to the model equation. Simulating with the LLE is then fast. It takes you 30 seconds, one minute, to simulate something that before two days. It is extremely fast. And this is due to the fact that, for those who are familiar with it, generally you simulate these PDEs with the FFT algorithm that, that is extremely fast in MATLAB, and that considers that the, the boundary conditions are periodic, per default. So generally people that work on optical fiber networks, they don't like it because of course the fiber is not periodic. So they always try to put the boundary conditions far away so that the artifacts do not perturb what you want to see. But in our case, it's like the FFT algorithm was made to solve this problem. The boundary conditions are periodic, so for us, we're just fine. And this code is 1,000 to 10,000 times faster than what you can do with the model expansion. And um, at last, the special temporal model and the model approaches provide two complementary and powerful ways. Still, when you want to study threshold phenomena, you cannot use the LLE. Uh, you know very well that what you have to do is to find the modes and find which are the first modes that emerge. So in fact, these two models are two models that provide significant inputs in two different directions, and they are then complementary. So as a conclusion, what I will say is uh, double UGM resonators are sources of very exciting phenomena. Uh, I think that I just gave you a glimpse of it, but a lot of things. Uh, they are particularly suited for optical frequency comp generation. I talked about the pioneering works of Hench and Hall, and how after that people thought that they could have come to these uh, small resonators. Uh, they have great potential for applications in aerospace and communication engineering. I talked about ultra-stable microwaves, clocks, radars. I talked about uh, photonic chips. I talked about uh, wavelength division multiplexers and um, other applications. Uh, both the model and spatial temporal <laughs> approaches are worth investigating. Both provide a specific insight that is not provided by the others. So I think that these two twin models are, per se, uh, worth investigating. So what is next? The first thing is, from the purely scientific point of view, there is a very strong need for answers. to several open questions. Um, higher order effects, I mostly disregarded them here because theoretically they are very difficult to analyze, but they are there, particularly when you want to go to large comps. Uh, and of course, use a typical nonlinear stochastic dynamics in order to investigate the features and the properties of this system. And from a technological point of view, uh, sooner or later, okay, comes we will have to deliver. So the thing here is that we need to optimize the performance of this system in terms of stability. Uh, you cannot, for example, imagine that you will send to a satellite a fiber that is vibrating like that with a disk. It cannot work. So it needs to be much more stable. Uh, we have to work on the versatility, on the robustness, and on the power consumption. This is something that is extremely important. So uh, please let me uh, thank my colleagues and collaborators. I would like to thank uh, Aurélien Quale, the postdoc working with me on the project, uh, Rémi Henri and Irina Balakireva, my PhD students, uh, with uh, Laurent Larger, and uh, they also uh, work, I think, very hard to push forward with this topic. I would like to thank uh, Patrice, uh, Etienne, and Roland, they are research engineers working on, mostly on the fabrication part and on the optoelectronic oscillators. Uh, Nanyu was my supervisor at GPL. The, all the model model was developed in collaboration with him. Uh, Curtis Menuk is professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. I worked with him on the general Lefer equation. Uh, and John Dudley, I worked with him with uh, a lot of things. Special thanks, of course, to Laurent Larger. You know that right now he's working much more on information theory, neuromorphic computing, and things like that. But still, we work together on, on this topic as well. I would like to thank uh, research centers and funding agencies that fund our research and help us to move forward. But most of all, I would like to thank you very much for your welcome and kind attention.
Okay, um, so there is uh, how it goes. <coughs> okay, here it goes. So basically, what you have is um, here, I just take the case of the simplest case where you have uh, a pump and a signal and input. If a photon comes here and another goes there, these two photons are correlated. It means that, in fact, you have a constant phase relationship between these lines. So if you just take this signal and you send it to a photodiode, you have a beating, and this beating will give you a signal like this. This, for example, is just a beating up there. You obtain a signal like this. Of course, this is like some kind of engineering measure for, for signal purity, but more or less what it says you is that if, for example, here you have 10 gigahertz, then uh, if you have here the frequency zero, if you go one kilohertz away from the 10 gigahertz, then the noise drops, one, one, drops 120 dB which is good, it's already very good, uh, but we think that the system can do more. So that's the first approach. The second approach is that we more or less want to do what Hunch and Hall did to obtain the Nobel Prize. But in their case, they had an octave spanning comp. Octave spanning means that in the same comp, you have one frequency and it's double. If in the same comp, you have one frequency, omega zero, and it's double to omega zero, it means that it has to be very large. It's not like you know, 200 volts, it has to be very large then um, you can use, uh, for example, nonlinear crystals to lock them, to do a, a feedback loop so that the comb is out of reference. The comb does not need any external reference to tell him what is this frequency or what is that other. So there are then two approaches to resume my, my reply. The first one, the simplest one, is to say, okay, you have a comb like this, you make a bidding, and then you extract this frequency. It gives you, I would say, microwaves that are, that might be of good, of good quality, for example, for radars. Because when you have a radar, you send a microwave, it does the round trip in a few milliseconds. So if the, mic if the microwave is stable in the meantime, in a few milliseconds, you're happy. Now, if you want a clock, of course, no one wants a clock that is stable in a few milliseconds. We want clocks that are stable on days, on months, years, particularly when you send them in satellites. Then uh, you need another level of precision, and then you enter into the field of metrology. And then I think you need an octave spanning clock so that you can lock the clock to itself so that it's, it's sufficiently stable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how I understood it was that um, for the disk shaped uh, WGM, you approximate yeah, you approximate it as a, as a two dimensional structure, right? So you don't mm -hmm. consider the uh, higher orders in a different dimension. But this will certainly hurt your. Um, your um, <coughs> symmetry, right, for the frequency course. I mean, you have scattering effects, you have uh, interference effect, I guess. That's true. Uh, That's true. Is actually included in your model, model uh, model? That's true. That's a very good point. The thing, in fact, is when you do the disk, uh, typically the size of the spot that I showed you. Let me go back to that. Um, so we have things down there. Down there. Okay, so the size of this part typically is of the order of the wavelength. So if here you take a disk that is, let's say, 50 times, 100 times larger than the wavelength, like here if you have like 100 microns, 200 microns, then this mode does not see the boundaries. And so, so you're right. if you make it too thin, then it will hurt your Q factor. If, for example, you cut it here and you cut it here, then you have a lot of energy that is leaking out. And that will hurt your fuel factor, definitely. Mm -hmm. So in fact, you make it big enough so that all the mode stays inside the resume. But not too big. But not too big, of course. Yeah. Um, so one point about power consumption. Um, oh, no, they still do They all Never mind. Um, so your, your, your disk is, um, I guess, also of micro bigger than all the micro resonators. Yes, yes. So then the mode volume will increase a lot. 
That's true. So That's why, true. Why are you actually using such a big resonator when the when you have all these mighty disk resonators? Exactly. There are two reasons. The first reason is this one. The distance between modes <coughs> is inversely proportional to the radius. Mm -hmm. So if you have a radius that is very small, then the modes are very far apart. And uh, if you have modes that are very far apart, like 100 gigahertz, 200 gigahertz, you don't have, we don't have the electronics to manage with it. That's the first reason, practicality. Second thing is we don't know how to do them. To do a resonator like this, Yeah, the mushroom, I just wanted to show it. Yeah, to do a resonator like this, this is a technological achievement. I mean, you see a structure like this on a flat background that is five times smaller than the human hair. It is truly, I think this paper from, from Kittenberg, it was truly a technological achievement. It requires know-how. We don't have that know-how. What we can do are things like this. We can do things like this. And even this, this is not a complete work. We, need, we still need to work a lot on this. The third reason is, uh, we need, in fact, we are interested into the frequency here between two modes. If there are, we want typically to generate ultra stable microwave at 10 gigahertz. That's what we are interested in. If we want 10 gigahertz, then we know that the diameter of our resonator has to be something like <coughs> 5 millimeters, 4 to 6 millimeters typically. Then if we have a disk, whatever it is, it can be integrated, it can be whatever. If the size is 5 to 6 millimeter, then we know that we have a frequency here between two modes that is like 10 gigahertz, and this is what we want. Uh, most radar applications, aerospace applications, even telecom applications, they want modes that are 10, 20, 40 gigahertz apart. So that's what more or less rules. So to resume, do, uh, first of all, we cannot do the mushroom things. It's, it's another technology, which is useful. For example, people think they can generate terahertz microwave that is very useful for sensing for example, and things like that. But we cannot do it, first thing. Second thing is the size is not the range that we want. We want millimeter size so that we can have 10 gigahertz microwaves. That's what we want. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but first, because I'm, I'm glad that so it might be useful eventually. So that's, that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah. And, and then also you already answered many questions I had along the talk. Because when uh -huh. you arrive, you should, uh -huh. that looks very much like chat with everybody, <laughs> <laughs> as a matter of how it is. And then when, just one more comment, when do the simulation actually in the computer uh -huh. and under conditions, mm -hmm. uh, essentially, so the distance between modes you use is the, the discretization we use in the computer. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we are doing exactly that simulation. Mm -hmm. exactly yeah, that yeah. I mean, two, two, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And two more things. One is in... Well, lately there have been a few papers in Brussels, in mm. green places, in mm. fiber, fiber green places. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, and they do just a favorite as well, uh -huh. just quite that, they have this sort of for the right mm. And finally, above the, the fact that you, you have here the, the unstable L number, yeah. and then you have said the, 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 we call the secondary comp, yeah. which is called super monic actually, mm -hmm. and you don't see the second monic. I, we, we do, I just edit, cut it. Normally you, 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 larger, you do it. Yeah, you enlarge it, you will see them. Yeah, I, I did just cut it because I didn't want the picture to be too small. But um, but they are there. Definitely. You see seven out of ten, and then mm -hmm. the super monitor. Exactly. Because that appears in about well, that is already on the mm -hmm. That appears in a series of unstable things. Yeah, yeah. So that goes to the K. I I totally agree with you. And the interesting fact of the Ruggiero ever is we can accurately study. Uh, these bifurcations with the Lugetto with while well, it's pretty difficult with the model model. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's, it's very yeah, difficult. That's, yeah, it was an unfortunate choice, actually. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, first of all, I enjoyed your talk a lot. Thank you. Uh, but I was a bit shocked about your fading memory mm -hmm. uh, and your own earlier works on, on uh, uh, whispering gallery modes mm -hmm. in broad area pixels. Mm -hmm which are another beautiful example of where they, where they show up. Mm. And in that case, relating it to that, mm. um, in all these, these uh, beautiful whispering gallery modes you, you, you show, mm. they have a degree of freedom also as smoothly that you can... Uh, That's true. Uh, mm. that you mm -hmm. mentioned the importance of the minima and mm. of the extrema. Mm. So usually you have lasers, for example, that uh, some impurities fix 
the orientation exactly. of these modes. What yeah. about in your case and what influence mm -hmm. does it have whether the modes have this absolute degree of freedom or mm -hmm. are fixed by impurities? Um, that's a question that I ask myself. I think that particularly for millimeter sized discs, there's no way they can be so secular that there are no asymmetries. So I think that somehow they will be fixed. Now, I think that if they were not, that will add some extra phase here that I think will not be important if you want just to extract the intermodal frequency. That will be my guess. Now, as regards your, concerning your first point, I did not forget that. And, I would, and, I, and, and, and honestly, and I would like to say, I'm thankful to you to have introduced me to that field because when I went to, because most of the, I mean, the modern model, I, I did that when I was at GPL. And uh, my first intuition was, at the end of the day, the pixels that I studied with, uh, with you are nonlinear cavities. So if we can find a model model for the nonlinear cavities that works well, then we can find a model model for these things as well. So the first thing I did is more or less try to, I mean, for example, if you see these steps. Um, sorry, just a little I'm going in the wrong direction. Uh, it's here. So if you see these steps, these are the very same steps that in fact you use for the, in the Vixel case. You expand the field, that nice work that uh, Pep Millet did initiate, you expand the field and after that you put it here and after that you do what we call the emission for the projection. And then after that, then you find an equation for each mode. So in fact, when I went to GPL, I was like, I did that at the FISC, I think it might not be that far. And that for me was, was a northern star, and, and I would like to thank you for that, giving me that opportunity to work on this topic. <laughs> <laughs> but that's my reply. <laughs> uh, it's nice that in your, your talk you have been asked many questions I had at the beginning. But mm. let me remind the, the, the path that mm. I guess in my mind. The first, in the first instance, you say that you have an optical frequency comb, mm -hmm. the free transform of this is a, is a series of exactly. spines, yeah. and then after, then, uh, what are you? Because what are the, the spikes on the on the resonator? But then uh, you you have shown what I've seen in many papers and many covers of, of journals. Yeah. Is that those uh, plots of uh, um, very um, um, flower-shaped uh, modes, mm -hmm. uh, but, but static? And is this related to the to the spikes or is not related to the, to the spikes? The, the shapes of the modes. Uh, yeah. Is very <laughs> and uh -huh. then you, uh, you you go to the maths mm -hmm. and you. Just, there, the flowers are not there. You see traveling modes, not the, sta not the standing wave modes, which are the flower like modes. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. there, there are lots of things, and then finally, in the, in your, when you go to the spatial temporal domain, mm -hmm. many things are clarified. Yeah. Because the, okay, you, you see then the patterns, uh, yeah. which is mm -hmm. difficult to imagine mm -hmm. in the spectral representations. Mm -hmm. But again, in the, there is still like one question I don't understand in the pattern. You say that there is something, uh, they are traveling, oh, yeah. this, this is consistent with the, the the model representation with yeah. traveling modes, mm -hmm. but what determines the, the, the group velocity of the thing? Uh, in the, I, I guess it's, um, there should be something related to the wave number of the pattern. Right? Exactly, the, exactly, it's exactly that. It's exactly that. So, you're right, if you consider a mode individually, then you have the node anti node structure. But when you consider all these modes here, then they interfere. And then when they interfere, in fact, uh, all the modes, all the nodes and anti nodes disappear everywhere but in a single place and that's how you have a solid one. So in fact it's interference that makes this flower shape disappear. But if you can say a mode alone, the flowers are there. But, but then in the in the in the modal regime, in mm -hmm. modal description you say that there was there were chaotic oscillations of the modes. Yeah. Then you go to the Lugia de Lefebvre and you say there is no chaos. So ah, no no it depends on the parameters. Uh, Lugia de Lefebvre, if I take the same parameters I will see chaos. No, 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 no. They still don't. But the periodic boundary condition will not apply anymore in case you have chaos. It will. It will. You don't think so? No. I mean, you can have a periodic You think so? I think it becomes a. I mean, in that. Take any PV, a PV with periodic boundary conditions, that can have such a like that. It can have, but it wouldn't be a destructive system. 
I mean, that, 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 that one has to see, right? because, because there's no other reason. Yeah, yeah, but, but something also that I have to say, and that comes to the question you asked earlier, I removed the good velocity, so maybe that's where the, the match is not exactly the same. But, um, but I will, I will, my guess would be that it, they will be there, but we might talk about it. Any other question? Or if not, we thank Jan for this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.